Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur back again for another look at Cindy Lincoln's recorded tours of the science building at Dinosaur Adventureland. Last time we explained that in fact transitional fossils are well known and link many major groups of life, and that the Cambrian wasn't the creation of various kinds of animals out of nowhere. I just want to remind you to please like this video and leave a comment when you finish watching it to let me know what you thought. Also, if you're not subscribed, please take a second to hit that subscribe button just below this video, and remember to use the bell to turn on notifications so you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. Without further ado, here's Cindy. Okay, so these are some of the things that vary. And we're going to talk about the difference between variation within a kind as opposed to variation that would take you outside the kind. Okay? Awesome. That is exciting. I am excited anytime there is an opportunity for the creationist kind to be well defined. So here's a human kind and a bunny kind. The only thing that varies in a bunny pretty much is the color, maybe the length of the hair, size of the ear. It's not gonna turn into any other creature. Well, right, as we covered earlier, evolution says that once you're a rabbit, you're never not going to be a rabbit. But what about hairs? Are they in the same kind? What about the pika? Are they in the same kind? How do we know? Also, I suspect that there are a lot of variations within rabbit, but I realize it's hard for most humans to recognize those variations. Humans are really good at telling the difference between different humans, but with other species, they're not so good at it. Probably because it's less important, since most other species, besides perhaps cats and dogs, which humans are good at telling apart, are not usually part of the human social sphere. Here's some of the traits that vary in a human. You might have bushy eyebrows or skinny eyebrows, fat lips or skinny lips, uh, freckles or no freckles, but they're all human. Yes, but saying that isn't really saying something with lots of significance. If you pick a group of organisms, then point out variation within that group, then simply because you picked all members of the group at the first step, you will only have members of that group at the end. It's sort of like going to the store, grabbing a bunch of carrots, then measuring them in various ways and concluding that, yep, they're all carrots. Well, of course, you started out intentionally not selecting anything else. Uh, this is a f the famous experiments of Mendel purple peas and white peas, their seed colors, and how they vary and uh, inheritance happens. Those are some nice punt squares. I approve of this. But again, micro changes never produce a different species. But a single pair of canines on the ark producing foxes, wolves, and coyotes is new species. Apes don't turn to humans. But why not? Speciation can happen, and there is far more genetic diversity between a fox and a wolf than there is between a human and a chimpanzee. If that amount of genetic change is okay, then surely less genetic change would also be okay. Macrohume evolution does not happen. But again, the flood model being presented here requires extensive macroevolution. Um, basically, the whole Mendel conclusion is kinds are stable. I would like to respond to that statement, but I don't really know what it means. You see, we haven't been given a good definition of kind. Um, let's see. Survival of the fittest, which is supposedly what creates variation. No, that's mutation, ultimately. Does not explain the arrival of the fittest. Okay? Even if survival of the fittest, to some degree, may influence what traits come out at what time, you might get a hairier rabbit in a colder climate. It doesn't explain how the rabbit got here. Only God can do that. Sorry, guys. He's real. Well, I certainly agree that selection doesn't produce new genetic diversity. Rather, it reduces it on its own. But mutation of necessity increases genetic variation by producing new genotypes that didn't exist before the mutation. It's logically impossible for mutation not to increase genetic diversity. Now, I'm not here to dispute God's existence. I'm perfectly happy for Cindy to believe in God. But it's simply not true that we need miracles to increase diversity and create new variations. Let's take a look at the Sphinx cat. This cat resulted from two different lines of hairless cat in North America, which had a known mutation, and both occurred in the 1970s. So we have a known mutation, a time frame for that mutation, and the knowledge that this mutation wasn't present in older populations in that same area. 
So there it is, the arrival of a new trait. And you might argue that this trait isn't beneficial, but whether it's beneficial is dependent on environment. And in an environment where humans will help you eat, keep you healthy, and provide you with breeding partners, all simply because you have this new trait? That's pretty beneficial. But we also know about the mutations that allow the simian immunovirus to become the human-infecting HIV. And we know that it had to happen sometime around the 1920s to 50s. So again, we have direct evidence for new genetic diversity arising from mutation and then being selected for. Some variation has nothing to do with the environment or survival, it's just color variation. And these are different cat varieties. But coloration does play a role in survivability. There's a reason wild tigers don't survive long if they're white, or why polar bears are all white, or why coyotes are basically the color of the desert. I'm not really sure what the argument is though. It's certainly true that animal colors vary. Darwin himself acknowledged in his book, Origin of Species, page 211, if my theory be true, his theory about slow, gradual changes over millions of years, then numberless intermediate varieties, otherwise known as transitional forms, must assuredly have existed. Yep, he did say that, and he was right. Fortunately, we have transitional forms as we've gone over. And also, Darwin's gradualism wasn't quite right. Often there are times when isolated populations undergo relatively rapid evolution, which is why transitional species within, say, a family are usually not too commonly found, although there are exceptions. But why we have abundant fossils linking together things from about the order on up through the Linnaean ranks. He predicted that the fossil record would start to show these uh, after his time. Fortunately for him, one of the most impressive transitional fossils, Archaeopteryx, was found within his lifetime, at least partially confirming his ideas. However, it's been 150 years, and we still have scientists telling us there are none. Again, that's not actually true. Although I don't think Cindy is being dishonest, she was misled by Kent about a lot of these things, and this is simply one of them. We need to remember that Cindy Lincoln is Kent's victim, not his collaborator. My goal in this is ultimately to show her that he lies about even more than she thinks he does. Okay, here we are in our man room. Needs more video games to be a man room. Just kidding. I know it's about human evolution. And one of the big things of evolution is that humans are animals. So animals are eukaryotes that lack a cell wall, are held together with collagen, and have an internal digestive system. This includes sponges, jellyfish, flatworms, insects, and yes, humans. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't make sense to treat humans as more important than other animals, and I think there are good arguments that as moral agents in a unique way, humans are quite special among animals. And if you want to put that in terms of the Imago Dei, or the image of God, then I have no quarrel with that. But from a scientific standpoint, there can be no argument that humans are animals. In Ecclesiastes 3, 18 and 19, we read, I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts, for that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that man hath no preeminence above the beast, for all is vanity." So even the Bible acknowledges the deep connection between humans and the rest of the animal kingdom, all while upholding human exceptionalism. Everywhere you see this in the books, that humans evolved from monkeys. Take a look at these monkeys. Well, yeah, although that means humans are monkeys, because remember, once a population diverges into a new group, its descendants are always part of that group. Also, some of those animals are not monkeys, some are lemurs, and I think I see a loris. Those are primates, but not monkeys. One quick way to tell if a primate is a monkey is to see if it has a wet nose. If it does not, it's not a monkey. There's a quite a variety of monkeys, but they are all unique. I agree wholeheartedly, and the thing is, that that's what evolution is all about. As new species branch off, they develop unique attributes that are not and cannot be shared with their relatives, who are now in different species. And this only compounds itself, so that over time one species can become two different species, and then they can become four, even more different species, and so on. Then after a long enough time, you can get amazing diversity within a group like the monkeys. I don't think this guy turned into this guy. I don't either. Evolution doesn't say that modern animals are the ancestors of other modern species. Rather, that they share a common ancestor. Cindy pointed to a loris and a gorilla. The common ancestor of these animals was probably a creature that looked more like a squirrel than either of them, except it had nails instead of claws and didn't have rodent teeth, and it had enclosed eye sockets. 
But then as it speciated and evolved, one lineage would develop nocturnal habits and surprisingly enough, venom that it secretes from its armpits and rubs on its teeth, and ate fruit and insects. The other became big and terrestrial and specialized in eating leafy greens with a big pot belly for fermentation, and it lost its tail, but got significantly smarter. But one certainly didn't become the other. And certainly none of them evolved into a human. Again, and for the same reasons, this is correct. No modern species of monkey is ancestral to humans. They are cousins, not grandparents, to humans. This kind of thing that we see in the textbooks all the time, may I point out to you, this is an actual photo. This is an actual photo. This is all imagination. Doesn't happen. Well, none of those are photos, it's a painting. But the stuff in the middle represents forms like Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus africanus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus, all of which are real animals, of which we have hundreds of specimens. Now, the life reconstruction we can see here is obviously at least a bit speculative, and in reality, it's not a simple progression but a branching tree with side branches like Australopithecus boisei, which is on its own branch. But it's not really true to say that the middle four organisms are imaginary. What might be a more fair thing to do would be to dispute what those animals were really like, rather than saying they didn't exist. Um, if you go back over here, this is what I learned when I was in school. I learned about Nebraska Man. That would be unusual. Nebraska Man was never widely accepted in the scientific community because of the fact that it was based on a single, very worn tooth. I don't know for sure what textbooks it may have made its way into, but it was few of them because Nebraska Man was never really in contention for a human ancestor. Now let me show you if I could peek under the camera here. This is the one and only piece of evidence they used to create this whole false scenario. Yes, Nebraska Man was based on one worn tooth, as I said. It turned out to be a peccary tooth, and that's why it was never taken seriously. One worn molar isn't enough to identify a hominin, especially when such identification was done by someone who was not trained in paleoanthropology made me think that we had ancestors that were dumb, primitive, animal-like. This is a lie. I mean, I don't know that I would call them dumb, but primitive and less similar to modern humans in terms of cognition does describe human ancestors. Just not Nebraska man, because there's no such thing. Also, it's not a lie, it's a drawing made for a British newspaper, not a scientific publication, and it was entirely speculative. But there's a difference between drawing what you think something might have looked like, based on the idea that you think it exists, and intentionally deceiving people. So if that's a lie, then by the same standard, all the dragon pictures we saw earlier in this tour were also lies, because they were all different and can't all be the same animal. But I wouldn't go there, and I would hope that Cindy would not either. They also found out that it didn't even belong to an ape or a human. It belonged to a pig. Well, not quite a pig, but a peccary, which is what's shown in that picture. But yes, scientists who accepted evolution noted that it would be unexpected to find a hominin in ancient Nebraska, and then later again, evolutionary scientists identified the specimen as being a peccary molar. This is a demonstration of the self-correcting nature of science. False claims tend not to persist. This is actually called the Hall of Shame. This is all, not, I don't know about all, but almost all, of the so-called evidences used in our textbooks to say that humans and apes are related. That humans came from ape creatures. They all involve fraud. Sometimes there's filing down, there's staining, there's just plain wrong. Okay, we have Heidelberg man, so Homo heidelbergensis. That's a valid taxon to this day. We have Nebraska Man, which wasn't a fraud, but was not real. It was an honest mistake made by a non-specialist. We have Piltdown Man, which was a fraud found out by scientists working on human evolution. Not creationist busting evolution. We have Peking Man, which was just Homo erectus, which is still a valid taxon. We have Homo neanderthalensis, which, while not directly ancestral to Homo sapiens as a whole, is still a valid taxon. And we have Cro-Magnon, which is just Homo sapiens, the species that's still around. The term Cro-Magnon isn't really used in the literature anymore, but it's not because the specimens it refers to have been debunked in some way, but because there's really no distinction to draw biologically between Cro-Magnon and modern humans. 
So of the six presented examples, one was a mistake, one was a hoax, both of which were caught by scientists using evolution to realize they didn't make sense, and there's nothing wrong with the other four. Plus there are many hominin species left off of this entirely. I'd say that's actually nothing to be ashamed about at all. But we're going to leave this episode here for now. We're going to continue with episode six, which will be the finale. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please do remember to hit like. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do subscribe. And finally, I'll say thank you to my patrons and channel members. I just want to take a second to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 and above. Bob Knob, Bent Hovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Res Instance. My channel members and patrons help make this channel possible, and without their support, this channel really wouldn't exist. If you would like to help support the channel as a member or patron, there are links in the description to both join the channel as well as join the Patreon. Patrons and members get mentioned in these credit scenes, as well as getting early access to my scripted videos, and if you pledge $10 or above, you can also get access to various 3D assets that I create for Blender, both for use in the channel, as well as just general giveaways to my supporters to help in any Blender projects they might have. If a monthly or annual pledge isn't for you, then there is also a merch store linked in the description. And if none of that's right for you, please just like and subscribe because every like and subscription really helps the video out. Thank you.